Okay, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, I have to apologize. We're having some technical hitches, so I we cannot really uh, see. But thank you very much for joining us today for the launch of um, the Landscape Greenhouse Gas Accounting Guidance. Uh, in the next, hopefully, 90 minutes, we hope to take less time than 90 minutes, we are going to delve into how uh, landscape scale uh, projects can help us in dealing with uh, climate change and delivering the climate finance that is needed. I would like to first apologize for, I think we had a bit of a, of a miscommunication time-wise. The original time we would start was uh, slotted for 2 p.m. Amsterdam time. So for those who have been waiting due to the mishap, we deeply apologize and we accept, uh, we appreciate your patience that you're still here with us. Um, I will not take too much of, of, of time introduction. So we would go directly to the first speaker who is uh, Elton Mzervivi, who is from Wetland International and he's the project manager for, for our partnership project. Elton, if you can hear me, please take it away. Uh, yeah, could uh, I be, could my video show please? Could the host uh, enable my video? We can see your screen, Elton. Uh, we cannot really see your video, but we can see yeah. that you're sharing your screen. I see that I'm, uh, yeah, my video is uh, not enabled. So, yeah, and would it be possible to enable? Nikita, is that possible? Well, yeah, um, let me start while that is being fixed. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the launch of the Landscape Carbon Accounting Guidance. Uh, my name is Elton Mujigazi. Um, I hope my video will be fixed. And uh, yeah, I serve as a program manager for holistic landscape restoration uh, at Wetlands International, the organization that has led the development of the guidance that we are introducing today. Wetlands International is a global network organization that is dedicated to the protection and restoration of wetlands and landscapes surrounding um, these uh, wetlands. Uh, as a science-based international NGO, we have contributed to the IPCC wetland supplement and various carbon accounting methodologies. We have also played a pivotal role in the design and implementation of one of the first large VERA certified Red Plus projects, which is the uh, the cutting and mentire in uh, Indonesia. Uh, yeah, our, our publications have also shed light on uh, the role of carbon markets in safeguarding landscapes, particularly when, uh, landscapes uh, that uh, are dominated by wetlands. Um, I will. Yeah, this, so the, this is the run of show. Um, I will be mainly talking about the underlying drivers of this initiative. So together with uh, our partners, uh, yeah, I will, let me just click away some of these uh, slides. Um, so the, the guidance has been quite uh, long in coming. Uh, and the journey to develop the landscape carbon guidance has been uh, 
he has started since 2021 with the initial idea to create uh, two um, uh, initially the two a landscape uh, methodology uh, So initially with the landscape methodology, uh, in, the idea was to develop uh, a landscape uh, carbon accounting tool, which is a new, which was a new tool. And uh, with, in consultation with uh, other actors like uh, Vera, we shifted focus to, to look at uh, creating uh, clearer or uh, easier understanding of the guidances and the tools that the methodologies that are already available. And so in 2022, we focused energies on uh, yeah, looking at uh, developing this guidance. Uh, and then later on, early this year, updating it uh, in response to methodological changes that uh, happened uh, within uh, the 2022 and 2023, but also uh, the changes in the carbon market. And leading us to the final guidance that we have today. And this guidance will be available on our website, uh, on the wetland website. And will also be soon available uh, on the four returns uh, platform as part of uh, four returns guide, guidance, which I will also speak about. So the driving need, uh, the, the factors driving the need for landscape carbon accounting guidance includes uh, the fact that when we look at ecosystems, they are quite uh, interrelated uh, and complex, ecologically, socially, economically such that uh, integrated management uh, would be, uh, and the, the conservation and the restoration is often best done in an integrated uh, management approach that incorporates uh, all ecosystems and stakeholders. And when we look at uh, how to then uh, develop carbon projects with such a scale, landscape-wide scale, we realized that uh, there was, um, no methodologies or, or a very little guidance on uh, existing guidance on methodologies that uh, incorporate multiple uh, activities at a landscape scale. And where they are, methodologies are often covering uh, a small proportion or a subset of activities at the landscape. So how we thought of addressing this uh, is to uh, seeking to empower developers and landscape practitioners uh, by first developing this guidance that highlights, uh, by highlighting that uh, yeah, a landscape approach really matters to increase the credibility, the quality and the value of carbon projects. And also uh, number two, addressing the complexity that is associated with developing uh, verified carbon uh, standards projects with a landscape-wide approach. And number three, that integrating projects, uh, yeah, integrating projects at a large scale is, is the situation that, typical situation that you find in a, in a landscape scale. And lastly, the ability to integrate uh, carbon projects within a wider landscape and thereby mitigating risks uh, of isolated uh, projects. The approach we took is through providing a guidance that first uh, focuses on verified carbon standard and uh, with particular focus only on only nature-based components. And two, uh, that provides an overview of steps that are required in developing a certified uh, and certifying a verified uh, carbon standard project. And also the guidance uh, is, uh, yeah, provides uh, also guidance on what is required and what can be done for each component of a carbon project to make implementation uh, of a landscape wide uh, project easier. 
It also comes with decision trees that help developers to choose appropriate methodologies. And uh, with the use of a hypothetical study, case study, we try to provide various angles that and, and circumstances that you might find within a landscape uh, scale uh, at landscapes that are typical within a landscape uh, situation. So we believe that that can be quite adaptable in the in different circumstances. With our partners, uh, particularly Common Land and Landscape Finance Lab, uh, Lab, we use the four returns framework for landscape restoration. And the idea is that uh, carbon projects should not be isolated uh, initiatives, but should be an integral part of a holistic landscape approach if they are to be sustainable and maximize the impacts and what we uh, the the summary of this framework that i'm sharing uh, is a vision of a landscape where uh, that produces if you look at the bottom row here that produces four kinds of returns uh, the return of inspiration the return of uh, yeah social returns and nature returns as well as financial returns all coexisting within the landscape. And if you look at the second from bottom row, that it's uh, three, uh, three zones uh, combined and are ex coexisting within the same landscape. One catering for, dedicated for nature and another one for economic activities. And one that also combines both nature and economic activities all coexisting as part of the management approach to a sustainable landscape. And the vision that the four returns framework also encapsulates uh, is one where stakeholders are, all stakeholders are included in a landscape partnership that is driven by shared understanding and a, a shared vision and a plan for action that is implemented and uh, collaboratively, uh, yeah, collaborative learning taking place, which we call five elements process. And all this taking a, a long-term perspective whereby uh, we look at, uh, for instance, one generation, 20 years, a long-term perspective that is also consistent with um, what you, the requirements of the permanent requirements of uh, carbon projects for instance, as one example. So the whole idea is that carbon projects are quite uh, yeah, a key part of uh, addressing the climate and biodiversity loss, but for them to be sustainable and impactful, they should be part of an integrated long-term uh, landscape approach. So what are the intended outcomes for developers and practitioners um, using the guidance? So this is meant to simplify the process of implementing landscape scale uh, projects, carbon projects, and to ensure that more projects can operate at a sufficient scale, which is landscape wide. And that should be help them to attract more demand and investment from the voluntary carbon market and drive a more holistic, uh, sustainable impact for people, uh, economies, and nature. All this uh, work uh, would not have been uh, possible without the support and the funding support from uh, our funders, uh, Common Land, uh, Common Foundation, Common Foundation, as well as uh, Conservation uh, International. So, Common Foundation supported this work through Wetlands International, uh, and then teamed up with uh, Conservation International, and uh, also the contributions, in the reviews, and contributions from our four returns partners. Uh, sorry. 
Core Returns Partners, uh, Common Land and Landscape Finance Lab, and also consultations with Vera, uh, which also informed our, uh, our conclusion to develop a guidance instead of developing a new methodology. But also not forgetting our close associates, close advisors, Sylvester Climate Associates, who have been with us throughout the process, guiding us and uh, in the development of the guidance. And uh, now we will hear from uh, uh, Leia Glass, who is uh, from Sylvester Climate Associates, to take us into the guidance document. Leia. Fantastic. Thank you, Elton. Um, if you could just move your slides on. Um, wonderful. Uh, so my name's Leah. I work with Sylvester and Climate Associates, and it's really great to be here today and part of this webinar. Um, yeah, and thank you to Wetlands and its partners and kind sponsors for, uh, for leading this really important work. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks now, uh, Elton. So um, Elton certainly covered some of this in his um in his uh, in his presentation, uh, but really to kind of like ground us in the context of why this work is so important is that you know ecosystems are linked both ecologically and socially, um, and anthropogenic threats they're 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 not bound by ecosystem. Uh, for instance, if a forest is being overexploited and conservation measures measures are put in place to protect that forest, uh, unless the underlying drivers of the forest loss are addressed, it is likely that the adjacent forests will also become under threat. Um, and it's really, you know, working at a landscape scale really helps um, uh, everybody involved in the project, all stakeholders, um, to ensure that conservation and restoration uh, is on the level of permanence that is required in order to tackle the climate crisis and also to um, safeguard livelihoods and food security across the world. Um, I think we all know that working at a landscape scale is complex. There are a lot of stakeholders um, engaged, um, required to be engaged, that all need to kind of come together, uh, come up with a plan and then implement that plan. Uh, it has the potential to be very impactful, but it is a little bit complex. And really the idea behind this work is that climate finance should support this work um, and not add to the complexity. Uh, and this guidance document aims to try and kind of remove some of that complexity and provide landscape scale initiatives with pathways towards um, uh, uh, accessing climate finance. Uh, next slide, please, Elton. So the guidance document that is um, going to be launched today, um, as Elton said previously, um, it is focused on the verified carbon standard, uh, mainly based on their rules. But the, the overall concepts um, and ideas is, you know, is really relevant across a lot of different um, carbon standards that are relevant to nature-based solutions. It is focused on nature. Um, uh, that was one way to kind of like contain it uh, and it's really nature that is most important at this kind of landscape level um it yeah, provides the steps towards developing uh, and certifying a bcs project uh and one of the things that every project has to do in order to um, access climate through climate finance through the bcs is to use a, a methodology uh, and that methodology is used to um basically understand what the climate impact of the, the, the project is, um, and basically the, the, the greenhouse gas accounting that's involved. So the guidance document, it um, yeah, it works through the kind of different steps and different uh, components of a VCS uh, methodology and provides some ideas and potential solutions to try and make it easier um, for landscape scale projects to implement. Uh, there's the decision trees as well to help projects understand what project activity category they're in uh, and also what methodology they need to use. Um, we'll go through that a little bit later. Uh, and as Elton hinted at, we try to ground the, um, the, the guidance document in reality by developing a hypothetical case study landscape, um, which covers a lot of different um, landscapes uh, and activities that you might see uh, in a landscape scale nature-based solution um, project. So if you move on to the next slide, uh, Elton, that just gives an overview of this hypothetical uh, uh, case study landscape. Um, so as you can see, um, there's a lot of different ecosystems in there. Um, there's terrestrial forest, um, uh, there's uh, peatland and peat swamps, grasslands, tidal wetlands in the form of uh, mangroves and seagrasses. And there's also the idea of, of, of kind of um, uh, 
more gray infra green gray infrastructure the idea with building with uh um uh, building with um nature um some of these acronyms won't make sense but they will later by, by the time we get through the presentation uh and also kind of grounding ourselves in the four returns framework which i think is is a really fantastic way of looking at these kind of initiatives uh that landscape has been divided into the economic combined and natural zones that elton mentioned in his um in his introduction and we'll come back to this case study at various points in the webinar the concepts that we're talking about uh next slide please uh uh elton so i think the overarching summary is that you know landscape scale projects have the potential to cover a lot of different ecosystems uh, and also a lot of different activities uh, and there's different ways to structure these projects depending on um, what kind of activities and ecosystems you're covering, uh, and also some of the more governance and social components of a project. Uh, for the sake of the guidance document, we identified two potential structures. Um, one where the project is encompassed, the, 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 the landscape is encompassed into one carbon project um, with one set of documentation that covers all of the landscape um, components. This has the advantage of uh, aligning with the holistic ethos of um, landscape scale initiatives. Uh, and it can also be easier for uh, project stakeholders that might have been developed, uh, involved in the development of the of, of the landscape scale initiative to understand because um, they're used to it being described and being discussed as a sim simple entity. Um, it's also can be useful for projects in the coastal zone where sea level rise may have an impact. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and lastly, also by combining all components into one one project has the potential to decrease transaction costs. What do I mean by that? I mean the costs associated um, with moving through the VCS process, so through validation, through verification. The guidance document itself provides a, a detailed rundown of what those different steps are, but by having just one simple project, one large project, so not necessarily simple, one large project covering the entire landscape, has the potential to, to kind of decrease um, those transaction costs because you're only doing everything once rather than multiple times. Uh, however, there are certainly some situations where it will be preferable to um, uh, divide um, the landscape into multiple projects. Um, uh, and this is what we call option two. Um, one of the components, one of the, the reasons why you might do this is from the perspective of ownership. Um, so project ownership really underpins um, all carbon projects, VCS and others, in the fact that the project leads needs to have the necessary control and legal rights to the land on which the, the project is implemented on. Um, the VCS certainly have pathways to have multiple project proponents or mul multiple project leads. Um, uh, but if there's, you know, if it's not possible to form an agreement or form a coalition of, of, of different project proponents, um, then it might make sense to kind of separate um, projects out depending on their ownership. Uh, another reason is also timing. Um, the kind of deadlines for things like validation and listing on the on the on the VERA registry uh, is different depending on different project activities. So for instance, ARR projects have a longer time period. Uh, reforestation projects, for instance, have a longer time period on which to kind of get to the stage of validation compared to um, uh, to, to forest conservation projects. Um, so if you're looking to kind of capitalize on the on the longer time periods of certain activities, you might want to separate activities out for that reason. Uh, and I think the, the other um, component as well to think about is that we're certainly seeing in the market uh, different demands for different kind of credits. One VCU is always equivalent to one like verified carbon unit, which is Vera's carbon credit, is always equivalent to one ton of CO2. Um, but different, some projects produce um, avoided emissions or emission reductions, um, and other projects um, produce more uh, CO2 removals. Uh, and different investors are interested in different kind of credits. Um, uh, so if you if you have a particular investor that's only interested in CO2 removals, then you might want to um, think more about structuring the project around that versus creating one holistic approach. Uh, next slide, please, Elton. So um, I certainly don't have time to go through all the components of a methodology. So I'm just going to touch on some ones that I found particularly interesting when I was doing this work. Uh, the first one is sea level rise in the relation to um, project boundaries. 
Um, this is an example from the hypothetical case study uh, in the fact that there's um, there's tidal wetland system, there's mangroves fronting um, right in front of um, uh, agricultural land. Uh, in the event of sea level rise, um, the salinity of the inland area is going to increase uh, and the agricultural land is likely going to become too saline uh, in order to farm. And, the, and it also might, if there is the capacity, it might lead to mangroves kind of expanding landwards. Uh, if those two projects were separated as two separate projects, it becomes quite complicated and you might end up losing project area um, with this migration. Um, but if this is factored into a whole landscape level, um, it makes it easier to kind of uh, manage the, 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 the impact that it might have on carbon revenue, but critically might also help you to manage the impact that it might have from a social perspective and the fact that if this whole area is incorporated into a carbon project and this and this evolution is thought of, there's the ability to, um, uh, to plan ahead and think of how the project might be able to mitigate some of the negative social impacts of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion um, on the agricultural land. And next slide, please, uh, Elton. So the um, the other components that we one of two of the other components we looked at was really setting the baseline and project scenario. So the baseline is what would happen without the project, and the project scenario is is what's going to happen with the project activities. Um, and BCS methodologies all require you to quantify both of those scenarios. So you need to quantify from a from a, a climate perspective, what would happen without the project and what would happen with the project. Uh, all VCS methodologies, um, they require some mixture of three different data sources um, to both establish and reassess baseline scenarios and also to, um, to um, monitor the um, project scenario. Uh, these are remote sensing. Um, that can be for either satellite imagery or drone imagery or anything that's not actually on the ground. Um, carbon stock inventories, which means going out um, and collecting samples in the field, um, and social research. Uh, there's a way to, by looking at um, the different uh, pathways and requirements of each methodology, if you're looking to combine multiple methodologies, it makes sense to try and find ones which use the same data sources for each of these components. Um, there's uh, Uncertainty is certainly a really important component of carbon projects. I'm not going to go into this in detail, um, but if projects um, have an uncertainty above a certain level, they have to they basically get less carbon credits. Uh, and, you know, and this can be an issue at a landscape level when you're working across a very large area. And this really requires good stratification from the perspective of different baseline and project scenarios across a landscape. Um, if you move to the next slide, Elton, that just this just shows a couple of the tables that we've generated as far, um, for the guidance document, um, which enables projects to see all the VCS methodologies that are applicable to uh, nature-based projects uh, and, and whether they use similar methods, whether that be for a baseline assessment or for additionality. Um, so if you are needing to work across multiple landscapes and use multiple different methodologies, there's the ability to try and find ones which have common common characteristics and thus are slightly easier to um to combine. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. So um leakage, such a horrible word, um, but a really important component of um carbon projects. So leakage is basically um uh, emissions, CO2 or other greenhouse gas emissions that happen outside of the project area due to the project activities. So if an area is conserving an area of forest, as we mentioned earlier, if that deforestation is just to move elsewhere, the emissions associated with that um, move deforestation is, is leakage. Um, so this is really where landscape initiatives have an advantage. You know, if you're managing things at a, at a landscape level and you're working with stakeholders uh, and working with nature across a, a wide, a wide different number of ecosystems, um, there's the possibility of thinking, you know, how things might move around, discussing with stakeholders different scenarios um, uh, and enabling you to understand what the potential impact for leakage may be and what kind of activities you might be able to implement, implement in order to, to ease that leakage. Um, and working at a landscape level, if those leakage prevention activities have a sizable um, uh, climate, positive climate impact uh, and the cost of monitoring isn't prohibitive, then there's a possibility of incorporating those activities in the landscape scale carbon project 
um, to both maximize the effectiveness of the carbon project and also to maximize the, 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 the income. Uh, move on to the, the next slide, please, Elton. Uh, so monitoring is obviously a key part of any carbon project and you don't get, you know, you can't get carbon credits without doing some monitoring uh, and showing that the, that the climate impact that you were saying was going to happen has actually happened. Uh, one thing that we're seeing, we've seen a lot in the last five, 10 years and in, in, particularly in the last couple of years um, is the, the advent of technology uh, and the ability of technology to improve the efficiency and lower the costs of, associated with monitoring. And this is critical when you're working at a landscape level, which is very large, and you're thinking of doing forest inventories across hundreds of thousands of hectares, that's going to come at quite a high cost. Um, so the idea of kind of bringing in technology to help to minimize the costs um, can be a, a, a real positive for, uh, for landscape scale initiatives. Uh, the... Vera, certainly um, the Vera of the group which coordinate the um, verified carbon standard and they're placing a, a big focus on what they call DRMRV or digital monitoring, reporting and verification. Um, and they're reviewing about how it can be better incorporated into the standard requirements to enable carbon projects to, um, uh, to, to use technology more efficiently and freely. But at the moment it's a little bit patchy across methodologies and almost all methodologies do come require some kind of field measurements. So this is really kind of like a call to action to all of us to think about how you know, we can work together to advance some of the technology solutions that are out there to help enable landscape projects to be more effective and cost-effective going forward. The last component that I'm gonna talk about in this, in this section is um, related to credit delivery and the advantages of working across different ecosystems. So depending on the project activity that you that, that a project is implementing, it's going to deliver credits at a, at, at a different time. Um, for instance, restoration, when those trees are planted and after the, the trees are planted during the first few years, uh, they don't generate many credits because the trees are quite small. So a lot of those credits come later in the project. However, if you're talking about conservation um, and avoided deforestation, that avoided deforestation, that starts happening immediately if the project is effective. So one of the advantages of landscape um, scale initiatives is that they can combine um, different project activities to smooth out the delivery of VCUs across the, um, the, the project uh, crediting period. Um, so in this case, it's, you know, the, the conservation credits are adding um, uh, credits initially, um, and then later on the, the restoration uh, credits are coming in and helping to to add to the project finances once the conservation um, has kind of reached a plateau. So my last slide in this section is um, is is just really the conclusions um, uh, uh, and the fact that you know projects need to decide how to segment their project um, and there's kind of various pieces that you need to think about when you're doing a carbon project which can be de developed individually within a single project. Um, but you can also think about key efficiencies, like things like similarities and data types or analyses needed for ecosystems, taking ecosystem connectivity into account um, to really help develop a, um, a theory of change or a plan for the project to ensure that it is um, um, permanent and positive from both the nature and the social perspective. Uh, and the last piece, which I haven't really touched on much in the presentation, but is something that I certainly believe in when it comes to landscape scale initiatives is, you know, it, this enabling of more cons comprehensive stakeholder engagement and views of community impacts and benefits um, that can happen when you're working at a landscape level. Uh, that's it for me now. I'll come back later on, but uh, I'll hand back, a, I think we'll hand it over to you, uh, Killian, for an example of what this looks like in real life. Yeah, thank you example and especially experiences how it looks like so um, I will talk a little bit and very quickly about practical realities of developing landscape scale carbon projects we have been engaging in doing this for the last uh, couple of years and um, please go to the next slide Elton and how do we do this uh, first of all um, yeah we look at the landscape scale Leah has already explained that actually there are different ecosystems in the landscape and for each, for each ecosystem, a separate methodology exists. Um, um, and 
we use this mainly, a common land uses this mainly as an instrument to create finance from within the landscape. So actually, we try to fit it into our holistic landscape restoration activity program um, to finance activities that actually then lead to the restoration and carbon finance is an additional revenue stream. That's how we see it. Um, because it has significant uh, potential for sequestering carbon, especially the land-based carbon projects that we have been talking about and that the guide is, has, has showed how, how they could, could be combined. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, when we apply VCS methodology to landscapes, um, yeah, we first of all really look into feasibility and uh, that already shows us a lot about how well is a, is a project, a VCS project received uh, from by the landscape stakeholders and what is the cost benefit about this mainly. And uh, some learnings that we got so far from, from work that we've been doing with land-based projects within landscape restoration programs, within existing landscapes, together with partners is that there are opportunities and challenges. So uh, opportunities, um, mainly are that the landscape partners really see a concrete landscape finance opportunity in carbon projects. Um, that is very nice. Um, a lot of landscape restoration activities are still financed through philanthropy or through grants, uh, to, to public or private grants. Um, but uh, carbon finance really is seen as a way to make landscape restoration a self-revolving and, and a self-sustaining process. Um, what is nice with VCS projects, and, and that's also what we what we found out in, in looking at them, um, is that they provide the option to make projects grow organically through group projects. That means um, when we develop carbon projects in a landscape, we start small with a small area or with a, a specific practice. Um, and then actually we can make the projects grow by grouping the different project instances in the landscape. Ideally, then actually different carbon project types will be combined, but each of these project types in a landscape can start with a small pilot and uh, made grown organically. Um, so the guidance provided with the decision tree along the that was developed along with the um, landscape greenhouse gas accounting guidance presented previously by Lea um, shows how the different methodologies can be combined flexibly within a landscape. Yeah, because every landscape is different. Um, there is a range of different ecosystems in, in each landscape and, and, and that kind of combination of ecosystems differs from each landscape, also depending on climate zo zones. So actually there's a good tool at hand. Um, you, you can have a look at um, if you want to really know which methodologies should you choose for uh, developing a holistic landscape restoration carbon project. Um, we have made mainly the experience with VM42 uh, so far, um, and it showed to be a versatile methodology um, because it can be used to uh, with different agricultural systems, first of all, and different agricultural practices. So uh, VM42 in a landscape restoration project uh, can be used for cropping, uh, for improved grazing, uh, for mixed farming systems, and even for agroforestry. So it already provides quite a versatile um, yeah, set of, of, of uh, activities. Uh, the biggest challenge we have found in uh, assessing feasibility, but also in project development was really that uh, often the cost benefit ratio was quite challenging. It was actually not as attractive as um, it should be for convincing land users to just go all in into carbon project development. Um, so, um, especially the transition of management to a new uh, land management activity can create high costs. So these are opportunity costs that uh, often are not completely covered by the carbon uh, project revenue. But this is why we always uh, highlight and, and, and we, we also tell this uh, to landscape partners that actually carbon finance is an additional revenue stream. So it cannot be the panacea for uh, a landscape to create all the finance for the landscape restoration project. Um, then actually during the project timeline, and you have seen the graphs before how pro different project types create actually uh, carbon benefits along the project timeline. Um, during that project timeline, the, the break even of costs versus benefits 
actually is always kind of it's not very defined it really depends on the landscape it depends on the complexity of the project uh, the complexity of the agriculture system and especially the shift to 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 which um you want to actually go um so it's 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 really uh, that kind of setting which um determines the point at which the break even occurs during a project development and the second thing is that it depends on successful project implementation. That means actually there needs to be a strict management and a strict coordination of the uh, management interventions that are actually part of the project scenario. Um, we have also seen that farmers are rather adopting a practice change uh, if it does not deviate too much from their current practices. Uh, the further away the practice change is, the more difficult it, it has become to uh, convince farmers to board a carbon project in a, in a group project. And um, in a group project, especially, uh, there is the issue of shared risk. Um, so uh, it has the advantage to create shared benefit. On the other hand, it also has the, uh, I call it burden now to share the risk um, through the buffer pool in a, in a group project. And that, that, that can also really lead to a dispute between farmers, especially in a setting where farmers are highly uh, non-community based, but in an economic system where farmers are very individual, individual farming and individual actors on, in, on the economic market. Um, Last but not least, we found that the carbon potential of different practices uh, within a VM42 project um, really depends on climate uh, the climate zones, and it can really vary according to the climate, because it heavily depends on precipitation, on temperature, and I think this is generally uh, knowledge that has already been found uh, in, in in research. Next slide, please. Um, so what we what we then do is we really have developed our project development workflow um, because project development takes several years and should be an inclusive process, including the stakeholders. Ideally, it should actually the project should be implemented by uh, the stakeholders themselves or by a, by a partner organization that works closely with the stakeholders. And so we have a chain of analysis, first of all, using a scoping and a carbon quick scan that then actually leads if, if we can identify a suitable project type to a, a feasibility study where we assess the cost benefit of the, of the project. Um, and with, with that information at hand, we go and we identify an additional need for, for funding, for investment into the project. But at the same time, we can also convince the uh, farmers and stakeholders that are part of a future project to participate in it. So it creates trust among the different stakeholders and the partner and funders. Um, and with that, we move into project uh, certification. And you can see at this um, workflow how that works. It's largely aligned to the, the requirements set by VCS. Um, and I leave you uh, with this nice view of our workflow at this point and hand over to uh, Lea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Killian. That was a yeah, that was a really enlightening presentation, and it's great to hear from someone that's that's kind of thought about this and what it actually means uh, in reality. Uh, and I really agree with some of those challenges that you highlighted earlier, and I think some of them are coming up in the in the Q and A. Um, so looking forward to discussing them later. Um, uh, that is, uh, yeah. If you do have any questions for anything that's coming up, please do feel free to put questions in the continue to put questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, I am. I live in Madagascar and we have a cyclone hanging off the coastline, which is affecting my internet a little bit. But I'm going to have a go at sharing my screen because um, uh, uh, what I, um, uh, yeah, if you move on to the next slide, Elton, um, uh, but I want to give you a, a kind of a, a, a test drive of the decision trees that we've developed as part of this project. Um, so next slide. Thank you. Um, so again, back to the hypothetical um, uh, case study landscape. So we've got these different um, uh, these these different areas, different activities, different ecosystems. Um, if you move on to the so each of these uh, areas are covered by different project activity categories according to Barra. So in order to um, uh, in order to define procedures that are necessary for different kind of projects. Um, Vera has developed um, what we're calling here different project activity categories. 
Um, they're listed here in this table, and they're obviously listed in the in in the guidance document as well. Um, uh, and yeah, they cover all the different kind of activities um, uh, and different ecosystems that a that a BCS nature based solution project may um, apply to. And some of these activity categories also have subcategories. Um, uh, if you're familiar with the BCS, this um, seems all very comfortable. But if you're new um, to carbon projects or new to the BCS, and particularly if you're used to thinking um, from the perspective of habitat or um, kind of ecological connectivity and landscape scale initiatives, these um, categories can be quite confronting um, and also may not make complete sense initially. Um, uh, if you move to the, the next slide, um, uh, um, for the hypothetical um, case study landscape, what we've done is basically shown um, what each of those ecosystems and activities, what kind of project activity category they would be in. Um, uh, the most important thing with carbon projects we all know is having a plan um, that incorporates all stakeholders um, uh, as necessary to have a positive social and ecological um, impact. Um, uh, However, in order to access climate finance, you do need to kind of like fit in um, with the way that the BCS kind of sees the world and, and, and describes things. Um, and it's it's really quite important that projects understand what project activity category they're within, um, because there are requirements in the standard for each of these project activities that a project needs to abide by in order to be able to, to, to become registered and issue credits. Um, so it's really... Um, uh, uh, yeah, this is it's, it's really quite quite an important piece, and what we try to do um, in the in the guidance document and in the decision trees that we've developed um, is to enable projects to to understand where they fit in this ecosystem um, of different activities and sub um, activities. Uh, so this is where the webinar might fall to pieces because I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, uh, oh, so no. um, uh, see if I can do this. Hopefully you can um you can see that. Great. Yes. Uh, is it on um, full screen, Leah? Yes, I will zoom in. I will zoom okay. in. Don't worry. Okay. This is merely to show the scale of it. So, so the so two decision trees have been developed um, as part of this guidance document. The first one um, walks projects through how to choose which methodology. Um, you need to um, you need to apply. Um, so as you can see from this overview, it's a relatively large um, decision tree because um, you know one of the good things about the BCS is it does cover a lot of different activities and does cover a lot of different um, uh, uh, kind of ecosystems. So rather than thinking about things in the concept of a carbon project, what we've tried to do with this decision tree is to break things down um, into how landscape managers may think about their um, their, their their initiative. Um, so the, one of the first things you kind of know if you if you're if you're implementing a project is what habitat or land use um, your landscape covers. Uh, and then you might understand some of the threats if you've done a um, an assessment of the kind of things you might need to do in order to have a successful project. Um, then you're likely to understand this threat. Uh, and once you understand those threats, um, you know, the next stage is to is to define activities that the project might do together with all stakeholders to try and address some of these threats to the landscape and thus have a positive climate impact. Um, uh, so what this decision tree does is 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 it guides projects through, you know, the first thing they do is they 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 define what habitat or land use they're in, um, uh, and then they move down the tree. Um, and eventually they reach the, um, the, the, the methodology or in many cases methodologies uh, that may be applicable to their project. The area, the kind of like the, 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 the white zone at the bottom, um, every activity, every methodology has applicability conditions. Um, some of those are linked to kind of like project activities so they can be incorporated in the blue zone. Um, but others kind of like really sit outside of that. So the, the 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 section between the blue zone and the purple zone um really gives a space for um uh, certain decisions within the tree that don't necessarily sit within threats or project activities. 
Um, so to give an example, I'm going to go to, so the tree covers all the different types of habitats, um, terrestrial forests, um, peatlands, uh, tidal wetlands, um, agricultural land, um, and also grasslands. Um, I'm going to put the links to these trees in the chat once we're finished. Um, but for the sake of a demonstration, we can have a look at the at the at the forested peatland area, uh, the forested peatland section of the tree. Um, uh, so here, yeah, you start with this is this is the landscape that the this is the ecosystem that the landscape initiative is is managing. Um, there's different kind of um, threats that they might be under. Some are legally sanctioned, um, and others are illegal. Um, this is a very important distinction within the within the BCS framework. Um, uh, and then further down, you've got different kind of like activities that you might um, do. So, for instance, if the peatland has already already been drained, um, then you might rewet it or you might um, reforest it as well. Um, uh, and as you can see, there's there's some kind of like additional uh, applicability conditions uh, that if you go down through this route, um, you can see that um, for you know for for forest peatland forest conservation, um, uh, if the area is not being deforested, it's only being degraded. Um, and that de degradation um, is not due solely to the use of um, the extraction of fuel wood or charcoal production, then at the moment there's no applicable methodology. So another thing that this decision tree does is it highlights areas where there are current, currently gaps. Admittedly, since I started this work, um, a lot of those gaps have since been filled. A couple of others have reappeared. Um, uh, but it enables projects to see that, you know, under certain situations, the VCS is not is not applicable. There's no applicable methodology in there um, uh, for their activities. And thus either, you know, the, the way through that is to develop an applicable methodology. The other thing I wanted to highlight in this are these pink arrows at the bottom. You can see um, some methodologies cover multiple landscapes, um, multiple ecosystems and multiple activities. Uh, if you work at a landscape level, this can be really interesting. Um, and these pink arrows um, guide the users to understand which um, methodologies are applicable across um, multiple ecosystems and activities. The second decision tree that's been created um, is again back to those project activity categories, um, which it's really important that projects understand which one they're in. Um, by using an applicable, like a methodology that is applicable in your landscape, you know, that methodology should incorporate all the requirements for that project activity strategy, um, category. But it's still really important that projects do understand, you know, where they fit in the Vera, Vera ecosystem of activities to ensure that they really understand exactly what they need to uh, do. Um, so this decision tree is, it's similar, it's a simplified version of the previous um, tree that I showed you. Um, exactly the same kind of like ecosystems and everything. Um, I've removed the bottom half and the methodologies to for the sake of simplicity and um, ease of creation. Um, uh, but these uh, boxes here, they indicate what project activity category um, the activities are in. So these are legally sanctioned. Um, uh, if the threat is legally sanctioned um, for terrestrial forest, um, uh, then that is basically IFM or improved forest management. As per the table in the, that we showed in the presentation, uh, some project activity categories have subcategories. Um, uh, for instance, red, which is um, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. There's two, there's avoided planned deforestation and degradation and avoided unplanned deforestation and degradation. Uh, and this decision tree understands based enables users to understand based on the um, the habitat and the activities and the threats that the, that the project encompasses, which activity category they um, they fit in. And this is um, uh, tidal wetlands, are the, the, the area that I kind of like specialize in. And it is one of the most complex uh, areas of the VCS because there are a lot of different combined activities because these, you know, these systems are unique, um, particularly in their interconnectivity from the perspective of hydrology. So there's there's lots of different um, subcategories, uh, and as you can see here for 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 mangroves, this you know the, the decision tree shows you you know the differences between avoided planned and avoided unplanned, and there's also a description here at the bottom, and also in the main guidance document, 
the guides users um, to understand what these activity categories mean, and they can refer to the standard document accordingly to understand what, um, uh, what the requirements are for each of these activity categories. Um, uh, these are publicly available, and I'll put the links to the Miro board um, uh, in the chat um, right now, so you can have a look. Um, uh, but that, um, uh, that was a quick overview, and I hope my internet was good enough um, for everyone to see them. Um, I'll hand fantastic. back to you, Tabitha. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic, Leah. The connection was really stable. Uh, so, wow, yeah, lots of reflections I see in our chats. Um, what shall we do? Shall we have a discussion now? Um, we have Nikita, are you there? I think uh, Nikita and I have access to all the reflections that are coming in from our audience. Um, I don't know if Leah, you can see them, and Elton and Killian. Can you see the questions from the Q and A tab? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. One of them was asking um, about whether the Miro board will be available, and I've just seen uh, Leah sharing the link to the Miro board, so okay. participants can uh, access it. Yeah. And maybe you all could also let us know. Um, yeah, where participants could also access the report. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's good, Elton. I think what we can do now is if there are any questions from the audiences or further points of clarifications where uh, anything can be found, I think it's possible to raise your hand and what we could do is give you, um, uh, hand the mic uh, to, to you to ask your question. Um, I wanted to already, okay, yeah, allowed to talk, uh, Lies, Lies, I hope I say your name well, sorry if it's, I'm slaughtering it. Lies, you manage, Hi, yeah. everyone. really nice to, to see these presentations. So my question about additionality is because I'm a blue carbon manager from Brazil. And we have a look at to protected areas, but we have many problems on developing blue carbon projects. I think it's mostly because of the additionality, because as it's already uh, on Brazilian law, the mangroves must be protected. This has been a problem for us, but I think we we may find some some uh, options to develop it. And I want to hear from you if you have any ideas, because around every mangrove in Brazil, we have many families that could be, um, uh, could be helped by financing blue carbon. So additionality, has been a problem for us in this sense. So I want to hear from you, your opinions, and maybe some um, hint, hints, hints, <laughs> that how, how, how can we, can we um, turn this problem? Yeah, so Leah, Killian, I think that would be good. Lillian, do you want to do you want to go or would you like me to take this one? Well, I can start. And if you come across an idea, please just don't hesitate to bring it in. So, um, in fact, that's also a, a challenge that we have encountered, especially in Southern Africa and in other areas where there are a lot, are a lot of already protected areas. And the question was um, really, how can you develop a, a carbon project in a protected area? Um, just for anybody else, additionality really means that actually carbon finance, the carbon project, has to be the sole economic incentive to, to, to shift practice or to protect an area in a conservation area, for example. But because a national park is always already under protection, um, there is no additional incentive to do so. And that's why actually there is no 
there is no way to kind of come up with a carbon project for this national park. So I was thinking about it quite a bit, and I thought um, maybe a hint is if you look into jurisdictional approaches, um, that maybe jurisdictional red plus, but now actually also under development is jurisdictional agriculture carbon and other carbon project types, because they actually you could kind of um, look at a, at an entire jurisdiction, work with a government on um, yeah looking into how already protected areas could still, let's say, um, a, how a carbon project could create additional finance for a protected area for which especially, uh, which is especially underfinanced. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, the reality is for many parks, I think, and I'm not sure about how it is for Brazil, um, but um, there is actually an underfinance in many parts of national parks, of national park stuff. Um, so that actually it cannot be fully protected anymore, just in terms of lacking capacity. And so in internal communication that we were having with other project developers, but also in our team, actually it turned out that especially VCS had these cases already, uh, where project developers contacted them to develop a carbon project in, in an already protected area. And um, if you can prove additionality in terms of um, this missing or this underfinance um, of the area, of um, um, then you can actually um, you can actually consult VCS directly, and 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 they will have a look at the potential for the carbon project and additionality. So I wouldn't exclude it um, per se. I don't know uh, if you have already uh, consulted VCS and what what was your experience with it, but. Um, there is somehow a way around it, um, and I would look into jurisdictional uh, approaches and especially uh, assess a case-by-case -case situation um, where you really consult VCS directly and you have a look at providing this additional finance for a protected area that is under finance. So that would be my thought about it. I don't know, Leah, if you have something to add there. No, that was a great answer. I don't have a huge amount more to add. Um, I think the only other thing to 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 build on that is that um, uh, how things currently work, particularly for 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 conservation projects, is that you um, you you need to demonstrate that the that the area is under imminent threat, um, uh, which, as we know, for protected areas is is very challenging. Um, something that I know the VCS is thinking about and. Um, Sylvestrum as well, we've been thinking about it too recently, because this is another thing that's very relevant to tidal wetlands, which we work a lot in, is the concept of future threat. Um, so, okay, so maybe this area hasn't been under historical threat, but for some reason, either ecological or anthropogenic, um, the area may come under future threat. Uh, the VCS currently isn't really designed for this, um, but there's certainly, certainly people thinking about how, you know, how how is this possible? And it's certainly going to require some changes to the the, the, the fundamental requirements and pathways that are currently in the VCS. Um, I think the only other thing, a couple of things to add is, is um, thinking about how these areas slot into a landscape. So if you have a highly threatened ecosystem um, adjacent, there's a potential to kind of like incorporate it into to, to, to one landscape and, and share climate, climate. Are you there, Leah? Yeah, it seems as, ah, oh, she's yeah. back. Okay. Okay, um, uh, we have another question uh, from someone, Lars, if, if uh, Lars is there, she, he, he asked, do you have experience with what the minimum size of uh, projects um, in terms of acreage is, is, I think he's talking about what's considered landscape. Uh, I think Elton, you can take that one. So, so the person, uh goes like, do you have experience with what's the minimum size of a project, acres or hectares, would have to be in order to reach commercial viability for validating and verifying for carbon finance? I would put that to Killian when, it, yeah, okay. when we are now on carbon, yeah, for, for the size of the carbon project. 
Yes, it's a really good question. And it's in, indeed a question that is among the first ones that we get when there is interest to, to, to develop a project. Um, it is not that easy to answer because it depends on the type of project you want to develop, first of all. Each project has a different rate of sequestration. Uh, for example, trees, they, they sequester more carbon um, and also the, the, the path over time, the sequestration path is different. Then, for example, with agriculture carbon, where a lot of carbon is stored in the soils and emissions are reduced by other components. Um, so it is really, it depends on the type of the project. Um, and on the other hand, it also depends on the place where the project takes place because uh, in different countries, you have different costs for project implementation um, and you also have different opportunity costs. So I cannot give you a definite answer, but I would say that actually, as I already mentioned, for looking into a project, it always makes sense to start with a smaller project area and then kind of define an upscaling path for that project um, that you will follow over the next couple of years. Um, because that gives you security to kind of make the project grow. And you can do that to the size, the allowable size that is provided by the environment as such. Yeah, if you look at the landscape level, we always operate at, on at least 100,000 hectares. So I would say for a Red Plus project, we would definitely have to look at at least uh, 1,000 hectares. Um, and for an agriculture carbon project, um, depending on the area where that happens, um, I would definitely try to start with around 50 hectares and then scale it up to uh, around 500 to 1,000 hectares. But I don't want to um, give you a definite answer on this because every project is different and some carbon projects are viable on a small scale, while in another place, the same project type might not be viable on the same scale, yeah? So just yeah. keep... Yeah, thanks, Kilan. Uh, I'll give you the floor now to ask your question. Uh, you, need, you are muted, so you need to unmute yourself, or I can unmute you. Are you there? Anyway, I think uh, Alemayehu also uh, put his question in the chat. And the question is, did the methodology consider data from Africa, like Ethiopia? Um, I'm not really sure what he's referring to, the panelists. Uh, I think that uh, if Leah can hear, can, if yeah, you can hear, could you respond to this one? Did the methodology uh, consider data from Africa? Absolutely, yeah. I haven't I haven't seen that in the in the in the in the comments. Sorry, but um, it absolutely does. Um, uh, the um, every project is required to um, uh, to, to 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 give project specific information. Um, uh, and one of the trends we're we're seeing um from the perspective of conservation as well, like forest conservation, is that. Um, Vera's new requirements um, has shifted the, the, the focus away from projects providing that information, but rather um, uh, third parties providing that information based on country level or jurisdictional level analyses. Um, uh, so it's really, you know, it's it is absolutely need data from the country and the region that the, that the project is within. Um, and there's also an increasing recognition of the importance of local eco ecological knowledge. Um, uh, and how this can be um, incorporated um, into in into carbon projects and, and and broader initiatives. And there's been some quite interesting guidance regarding that. I'll try and find it and put the link uh, in the chat. Um, but yeah, it's a, a a worthy area of research and guidance documents at the moment. Yeah. Thanks, Leah. And a, a really good one from Frankie. He says, uh, thanks. What's the long-term perspective of carbon markets, given that we are aiming for net zero in 2050? Uh, and would this undermine the demand for, for credits? So I'm happy yeah, to... what are the long-term pros uh, pros uh, prospects of, of, of this? 
yeah, I think this also links to um, one of the questions um, that we received previously regarding the, you know, the, the Guardian article um, yeah. that was particularly um, uh, uh, addressing um, deficiencies within the, the VCS and, and according to their study. So I think this is all kind of like tied together. Um, the sector as a whole has certainly um, uh, been, uh, is under in increasing scrutiny and this is important. This is good, um, you know. If if we're to tackle the climate breakdown, um, these projects which are being used to, you know, to offset other emissions, they must be real, um, and the, you know, the emission reductions and removals that they deliver must be real, uh, and all of the standards, not just Vera, um, they're all looking at um, and trying to understand how they can tighten their procedures and and, and provide better assurances that that these credits are real. Um, we're also seeing increasing rating agencies as well, um, like kind of third party groups that are looking to, um, to 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 understand which projects are effective and not effective. And then obviously you've got global initiatives like the um, ICVCM, the in Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, that's you know looking at at each of the different um, standard bodies and their methodologies and trying to understand what you know what does good look like um, and um, uh, uh, and kind of weeding out the the, the less strong methodologies. Um, you know, th there is demand. Everyone is scared at the moment. There's no denying that. Particularly, you know, there is certainly demand for um, for emission CO two removals. Um, uh, and I I personally don't see that demand decreasing, but I definitely see um, investors um, and standards becoming you know more clued in and more um, uh, risk averse. Uh, so it's going to be harder, you know, projects are going to be under more scrutiny, scrutiny and they really need to understand the the, the standard requirements, uh, the methodology requirements uh, in order to successfully um, pass validation and verification and issue credits. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of the many solutions that's, that, that we have towards um, uh, heading towards net zero so i don't think it's going anywhere but uh it's it, it's becoming harder yeah that's reason. a great reflection leah on on yeah the the better the more the scrutiny uh the better um you know the, what the yeah the carbon markets can deliver more um so i think that was referring to the to the vera and i think it's tied to uh someone Anonymous asking to Kilian and Leah uh, on the role of digital MRV and the prospects and opportunities therein, I guess. Kilian, do you want to, to speak to that? Or, uh... Yes, yes. Um, okay, digital MRV. I think it's very promising uh, for above ground biomass, especially forests and uh, natural revegetation projects. So the carbon components in restoration projects that are above the ground, because I think it's it has been proven already to be reliably, to be able to reliably uh, estimate and, and predict um, above ground carbon uh, change. So change in the carbon stock over time. Um, but at the moment also there is quite some effort um, from different startups, from different companies, um, based on uh, yeah, some developments in research on quantifying soil carbon um, using this method. And I think that's still much more challenging because soil is not as, I would say, transparent in terms of there's a soil depth. And uh, actually, it's difficult to kind of penetrate this soil depth to quantify the soil carbon. That's the first thing. And secondly, soil is always covered or often covered by vegetation. So that is always like hampering uh, to use remote sensing products for quantifying soil carbon. Um, nonetheless, I see a good potential in proximal sensing. Um, proximal sensing is like remote sensing, just that you are actually much closer to the ground. And it, uh, it has the potential to reduce uh, monitoring costs tremendously. Um, and that, that is actually, I think, the next step where it will move to in terms of soil carbon. So if there is a way to combine remote sensing with proximal sensing in a project where you look at both soil carbon and above ground carbon, I think that can really help to reduce the monitoring costs. Um, so that's, that's actually my thoughts about it. So I, I think there is good potential. 
and it, it can help you really to um uh, to uh, to avoid high costs for measurements especially on large areas and in landscape restoration projects yeah that's that's what i would think about it so leah do you yes. have or, or maybe elton do you have any view on this uh especially for mangroves um yeah, it, it's a really interesting subject. And I fully agree with everything you just said, Killian. I do, you know, it's it's definitely um, a really important area of advancement as we look to kind of um, scale nature-based solutions. Uh, and I fully agree with all of the positives that you just said. I think maybe just, just to bring in some of the potential um, uh, challenges that are facing DMRV, um, particularly as things move more and more towards AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. I think transparency and trust um, uh, is something that, that that is definitely going to need to be built, particularly because you know a lot of these groups that are that are projects. Every carbon project is underpinned by trust and transparency. Yeah. If there isn't trust and there isn't transparency, um, then a carbon project is not going to be successful. Um, that yeah. trust and transparency is is related to um, the stakeholders that are part of the project on the ground. So particularly. Um, uh, indigenous people and local communities, if that's relevant, um, and you know these DMRV systems, they need to be clear because obviously their results dictate the flow of finance. So you know if there is a you know if if the the, the technology shows that there is less climate impact than predicted, that means there's going to be less money, and it's really important to ensure that all, all stakeholders understand and trust that. Um, from the the kind of like the local level and also the investor level. Um, uh, so I think, yeah, yeah, ensuring that these solutions are developed with all stakeholders and everyone understands them to the, to the extent that they need to, I think is going to be key for its scaling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Leah. I'll just note very quickly that the webinar is recorded and will be hosted on Wetlands International's YouTube channel. Uh, Nikita, could you kindly put a link in the chat, uh, just to make sure that um, our participants who are asking can easily access it without having to search. Um, and I see a question, Leah, here that is, I think is, is great. It, it, uh, I can see the link between uh, the decision tree and the question from Alemayu about the estimation uh, of carbon sequestration potential for farmlands uh, due to specific cereals. Um, I don't know if it's that. Yeah, that's. I think that links very well with the with the decision trees. It does. I might defer to Killian if possible with that question because uh, um, agricultural projects are not my area of specialty. Um, I can speak broadly, but maybe I don't know, Killian, if you've got some more specific information that you can bring to the discussion. You are mute. So, if I understand right, it's about. Uh... Uh, giving some concrete numbers about different crops and their potential to sequester carbon. Um, I think so. I, just, I want to play back that question and ask in which setting is this meant to be? Is it like a, a broad acre cropping setting in a semi-arid climate or is it like a, um, yeah, is it like um, a small scale agriculture setting in the humid tropics? Um, yes, to I, read the question, the, the question, yeah, says, how can we estimate the carbon sequestration potential of farmlands uh, okay. due to certain specific cereals? Mm. Which method is applicable? I understood. I misunderstood yeah. the question. I was thinking that there are some certain numbers required. Okay, how can you do that? Um, well, you can either go and measure and say, okay, you set up a trial. Um, it's always good to kind of link this this kind of task into an into a research project. There are, for example, um, international research institutes um, that are actually working on looking at these things. So the first step should be really to look into existing literature. Maybe there is already information you can use. Um, the second step, then, uh, if you don't find anything reliable, is really to think about setting up a small trial yourself. If it's actually, uh, if you can allow it in terms of time and if you can allow it in terms of the budget or if you are part of a research project. Um, and the third one would be really that you just model it by using a, a specific um, model of soil carbon model or even a model that, that accounts for the 
yeah, for the changes of vegetation within the system. And uh, for that, you need some sort of uh, capacity. You need a lot of knowledge. Um, there are specialized people doing this. Um, and that is usually always happening in a research project. So my, my advice would be really to kind of think about developing a concept node and then uh, looking for partners that can actually help you in implementing this. But if you are a research institute yourself, then I think you found a pretty nice research topic. <laughs> Great. Uh, Surya, are you there? Surya? Hi, Surya. Can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Hi. Please unmute. Yeah, you have the floor. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Um, my name is Dr. Surya Das, and I'm an assistant professor at Xavier Institute of Social Service, uh, India. Uh, so my question is, if uh, for, for our uh, our country, India, for uh, for certain area, if I want to develop certain proposal, uh, if there is a, a model proposal available, model report and proposal available on the internet, which which can guide me how to develop a proposal using this, this guideline, that that will really help. Thank you. Um, can I ask? Um, yeah. so yeah, um, a proposal for what? proposal for 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 carbon sequestration pro proposal okay, the carbon project uh, where, where where there is a mosaic of different kinds of landscape like the wetland forest croplands so in in landscape level carbon sequestration pro project if i am interested to develop such a proposal so if there is, is any proposal already available on or on, on detailed project report is already available on the internet using this guidelines so so that I, I can I, I can learn from that uh, that report and um, develop my proposal. Understood. Um, so yeah, so what I would recommend is um, uh, so they're not necessarily proposals as such, um, but every project that, that 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 wants to register with the verified carbon standard, the VCS, um, they need to um, first of all generate a PD, a project document. Um, uh, there's two versions. There's kind of like a pipeline version, which is a um, a, a, a slimline version, um, kind of designed to be uh, written uh, early on in the process, where you might not have the, all the information. Um, and then the full PD um, is required at the point of validation. Um, and then after that, every time that a project wants to um, uh, generate, uh, receive carbon credits, um, they need to monitor their impact. Uh, and write a monitoring report. So all of these documents are online um, on the VARA registry. I'll put the the, the link in the chat. Um, uh, and there you can see, um, you know, carbon projects normally use those documents to search for funding. So you know they kind of they they, they include all the key information that a that a potential investor might be interested in. Um, and then once they've created their either their pipeline or their full PD, they share it and they effectively use that as the the the, the beginnings of their proposal for um for carbon finance. So I'll share the link to the registry in the in the in please, the please. Um, chat. It, it will be very and, helpful. Uh, no problem. It will be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Surya, for 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 that. And Leah, we have a question on. What's the difference between this methodology and the one developed by Chavez Rao in 2014? I I think um correct me if I'm wrong um to um uh, Alamehu um but I think the 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 Chavez are you there, Leah? Okay, I until twenty fourteen is a paper that is. Um, uh, if you can put. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Sorry, Leah, we I'm lost back. you. So uh, I think we didn't hear the no last two or three sentences. If you could start again, please. It's okay. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I think the 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 et al. paper is related to allometric equations. Um, uh, and Ale, um, please indicate if this isn't the the paper you're thinking of, but this is the one that I'm familiar with. Um, allometric equations are what um, projects can use um, to convert tree measurement, things like height or diameter or crown, um, crown width, um, to convert those measurements into biomass measurements, which can then be 
converted into carbon stocks. Um, uh, uh, allometric equations um, are critical at the moment still to um, all forest carbon projects. Um, and one of the things that, that the VERA and the, and the, and the groups that, that, that audit carbon projects are groups called VVBs, um, uh, they're very interested um, in the allometric equation that forest carbon projects use. Um, and projects need to demonstrate clearly that the allometric equation is um, relevant and applicable to uh, the trees and the vegetation in the um, in the in within the project area. So, um, uh, I would say, what is the difference? You know, the the the, the is, is it mainly outlines allometric equations, and these allometric equations are a central part of 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 all forest carbon methodologies under the VCS. Yeah. And Alamayehu, you're there. Would you like to, do you have a follow-up point? We have about five minutes before, yeah. uh, and there are a so, few questions that I would still like us to uh, to tackle yeah. about practicalities. So Alamayehu, if you wanted to clarify something, please. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. So I'm uh, very much, uh, Happy for joining this uh, uh, webinar. Plus, uh, you know why I'm asking about this methodology, the Chavi methodology, and um, and then and 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 this method is. Uh, I did actually my PhD on the carbon stock of impacts, uh, as you said, on foresters, and then we used, in fact, the Chavi model, and not, we didn't, in fact, apply the Chavi model directly, but we did a validation with the local data, but. Uh, in Africa, you know, uh, many of our people are agrarian. So the major uh, contributions of greenhouse gas is from agriculture. And unless we, we unless we, uh, you know, you, you know, get uh, something like, see, unless we control uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from our agriculture, we could not still able to play our role as a scientist. So, there has to be, I think, a way to really minimize our carbon sequestration from agriculture. Now the point is, how can we do it? Because our uh, cereal crops are, are with, they don't have a big biomass like trees, okay? So can we say agriculture really contributes a big uh, ratio or a big uh, contributions like foresters? So if so, how, how can we estimate the carbon sequestration of uh, our grains or our farmlands, because to these years I am actually diverting my project into into on, on croplands, but I really couldn't find a, or I couldn't able to estimate their carbon role, their uh, their their extraction role. So, is there a way of estimating carbon their carbon extraction? Uh, a very you. quick answer from. Any take us on this one? Yeah, I can I can answer on that. So as I mentioned before already, so you can either use like measured uh, factors that exist. I don't know if there's a tier two factor for the place where you are in Africa. Um, and that actually is a fact of, okay, how, how high are the emissions from these soils and agriculture systems? And how high would the emissions be if you change it to certain management, for example, including cover crops or diversifying your crop rotation in a way um, one component that is an easy catch for um, for lowering emissions from agriculture systems is really looking at the fertilization. Um, reducing nitrogen fertilization, for example, is a is quite a significant component for reducing emissions. Um, and if you manage to bring in a lot of compost, so you can basically shifting to a more, let's say, extensive or regenerative farming system in the area actually helps you to kind of combine sequestration and emission reductions. How do you estimate that either by existing measured values? These are the emission factors. Um, uh, you can look at the soil type uh, and you can see how much carbon is stored in this specific area. Uh, in the soil, there are soil maps available. Um, there are also models, so there are measure, soil maps that based on different models, how the values were retrieved for these soil maps. Uh, for example, one interesting map is from ISRIC um, uh, that provides a global soil map for different regions. So you can look at how much carbon is stored there and then you can actually 
an easy way is to really look into the literature. I think there should be something out there available that has been measured already. But uh, if you really uh, want to, to go further and deeper, then you just try to find a suitable model that you then actually parameterize to your location and you run the model. Uh, then you can estimate the soil carbon sequestration based on certain practices and also the emissions that occur under this new system. Yeah, right. so that's actually what I can think of, but um, it definitely needs you to look into how you can you actually finance it or do you have the capacity to do it? Yeah, thank you, Kilian. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. We still have uh, quite a couple of good questions. Um, I will very quickly pick one. Uh, where do we have a link for the uh, for the guidance? Uh, that we are launching today uh, is it publicly available that's that's quite coming back quite uh, yeah often elton so we will be sending the uh, the document the link of the for the document to participants but it will also be available on our website uh, the wetland wetland international, international, international website, website. yeah yes yeah great um Maybe the last, yeah, Leah also put a link to the Vera registry uh, for easy, ease of access. Um, can we get an SOP manual from your side? Uh, Leah, maybe you can uh, respond to that. Um, uh, I, um, uh, I, I don't think it's so much an SOP. I mean, and there's, there's a lot that can be drawn from the guidance document that can be incorporated into an SOP. Um, uh, but yeah, feel free to um, to to reach out. I'll send you my 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 email. Um, just so I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but uh, I'm happy to chat after the the webinar to uh to fully answer it. But yeah, I think there's a lot to be drawn from the guidance document that can be incorporated into an SOP. Um, but it's not an SOP manual as such. Yeah, I think that's a very nice uh, point to end on, Leah, that we are all available uh, to our participants for questions, um, you know, using email. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, yeah, Leah put her email address there. Kilian, would you like to drop yours and Elton as well? And as we do that, there's a nice plug of a webinar from Killian about uh, MRV on digital MRV for soils. Killian, when is it going to be? Um, that's a webinar that already happened last year, but we have ah, a okay. channel in Common Land where you can actually look into three different webinars. One is on improved continuous monitoring of cookstuffs. Yeah. Second is the digital MOV for impro improved MOV for soil carbon, discussing remote sensing, proximal sensing, and also manual measurements. And the third one is about biodiversity credits. So that's maybe also interesting. Yeah, great. Thanks. And I think the very last one is from, uh, again, from Surya. Is there a project proposal online in which this uh, guidance is used? I mean, we're just launching it today, so my assumption is is none, but I will leave it to the experts. Well, actually, from our side, not yet. Um, so that's, yeah. that's brand new guidance. Um, but we are working on and looking at how can we apply the guidance in our carbon project development. But we haven't really provided a project document yet that has that 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 kind of um, uh, looks at that scale and and, and mm -hmm. different. That applies exactly that kind of approach. And when this yeah. happened, where would such a document be found, Helen? And well, in the red, you can have a look at VCS um, because that guidance is specific for VCS uh, methodology, and then you can actually um, find the listed projects uh, in in the registry uh, of the the project registry of the of the VCS, which is publicly available and and also accessible. Yeah, sorry, Leah, I think I cut you off. No, it's uh, fine. No, sorry. Um, hello. Oh, so sorry. I was oh, sorry. So I was just going to add to that. I was yeah, just going to add to that and say, say, you know, I think the the next stage of this, you know, it's been really interesting gathering all this guidance and 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 putting it out there. And I think, you know, what I'm really excited about going forward is, you know, is working with projects and working with, um, uh, with groups that are looking to 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 apply the BCS at landscape scale. So it really. 
um uh, yeah it's been a really rewarding project to work on and i'm looking forward to continue opportunities to to to, to learn more and, and add to the sector great well shall we wind up because we really just run out of, we have four minutes uh, five minutes past time um, on behalf of Wetlands International, uh, Sylvestrum, Commonland, and all the partners that we have uh, worked I'm, I'm with sorry. to... Excuse um, me? May, um, uh, may I ask one last question? This is regarding one of the Ramsar sites in India, and which where the Wetland International is also working. Uh, may I ask one question? Sorry, I, I'm, I know that you are running out of your time. That is that is one of the one of the riverine wetland, big riverine wetland. This is a Kabartal wetland in India, where Wetland International is also working. But the entire area almost has been converted into the agricultural land. And whether this type of project can help anyway in in conservation of this type of riverine wetland, uh, if you know Kabartal wetland, this is uh, one of the Ramsar sites, mm -hmm. and. Leo, Kilian, yeah. a very quick question, uh, short well, answer. A quick answer is, could you write us an email about yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think. yeah please, Surya, mm -hmm. just, uh, you can write us an email about it. Um, yeah. We have dropped our emails on the chat. You can copy us or you can direct your question to a uh, specific, uh, to one of us, and we will be sure to have and continue that discussion. So thank you very much uh, for making time. Uh, I see we have dropped from 80 participants to 45, so that just means we are way over time and, and we have other engagements. Um, yeah, so thank you for joining us. And uh, the recording is available on Wetlands International's YouTube uh, channel. And there's a link on the page. And I think we will do a follow-up email to other participants with all this information, including links to different documents. Thank you very much. And whatever you are enjoy your afternoon evening morning and thank you for joining us thank you yeah thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. bye 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 very much